So this morning, we've considered what it looks like to engage with our culture with Christ's likeness. But that leads to the follow-up theme for this morning, living and working in a post-Christian world. And we've asked Wendy Simpson to lay a foundation for doing that. Wendy is a longtime faith and work champion based in Australia. She is internationally recognized as a business pioneer, entrepreneur, investor, women's advocate, and cancer survivor. In 2013, she was awarded the prestigious Order of Australia Medal, which recognizes Australian citizens for outstanding achievement and service. Wendy Simpson, we are honored to, to welcome you to the 20, 2024 Faith and Work Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, here we are, the last session. How exciting is this? So uh, I'm going to say, good day. And uh, you did that so well, I'm going to teach you another little Aussie phrase. We say, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. And then the other person says, oi, oi, oi. So I'll do a good day and then a good day. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Oi, oi, oi. Thank you so much. You've made me feel very welcome. <laughs> it's good to be here. And haven't we had a great time? We really have enjoyed being with each other. I've been in marketplace ministry now for more than 40 years, and part of my Christian formation in a little Baptist church in Melbourne in Australia was to read comic books by Spire Comics. And there was one particular comic that really helped me to understand about integrating my my faith in the everyday world, and that is a comic about Tom Landry, the, cowboy, the Dallas Cowboys coach. And so I can trace my passion for integrating faith and work right back to that period of time, hearing about how Tom Landry integrated his faith and work. And here I am in Dallas. So it's like a dream come true to be able to see and feel the area that he was able to express his faith and work together. And so uh, it's a real joy and a delight to be here. And my colleague, Michelle Co is here as well from Australia. So we feel very welcome. The Southern hospitality, the welcome has been just fabulous. And you have given us a foretaste of heaven. You know, we're all going to be in heaven together, aren't we? Yeah. And, uh, and we're going to be from all over the world. And all of us are going to have a great time celebrating being in heaven together. So I wonder if anybody else had the same aha moment that I did when Tom Nelson gave us a word picture for what the, we're doing in the faith and work movement. Tom's analogy of the surgeon's scrub work in the sink, those conversations, were an example of giving us new language to be able to describe what we're doing, this idea of tacit learning. Isn't it wonderful when somebody gives us a definition, a new word to use, a new language to describe what it is that we're doing or what we have been doing? So today I'd like to share with you how I discovered a model that I'm using in Australia. It's helped me to gather people so that we can partner with God to redeem parts of our work. It's my prayer, just as yesterday Tom gave us this a way of, of remembering what tacit learning is through the scrub sink, it's my prayer that today this model will be of use to you as well. Because I think that what we'd all like to do is accelerate the growth of fresh ideas and fresh ways of looking at the faith at work movement in the USA. So why don't we pray and ask God to really inspire us and give us his message for the faith and work movement, not only in Australia, but in the US and all around the world. So will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us, that we are full-time ministers, we are co-creators with you, that you have given us this sense of destiny, 
that you are on the move. As Billy Graham said, the next great move of the Holy Spirit is going to be in the marketplace. And we want to be there. We want to be there with you. We don't want to miss this, Father. We want to be where the action is. And so bless us. Help us in this session to be able to really work with you and see what you're doing. And we ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So today's segment is focused on living and working in a post-Christian world. And we could also call it flourishing in a post-Christian environment. Now, Australia could be described as one of the leading English-speaking post-Christian nations. Not a prize that we should really want to win, huh? It's not a title that should be desired. But we do have a few regions in our major cities where we have uh, mega churches and we have a few Bible belts. But I never lived in any of those areas. So my presentation, presentation today comes from a lifetime of living on the margins. I have always lived and worked in a non-Christian environment where I've been the minority. And so I've always been looking for contemporary language, like we just heard in the last panel, that I've never been able to use the kind of religious language that you maybe use when you're in the majority Christian environment. And so I've been always looking for new models. How do I describe what the kingdom of God is like? Because, you know, we want to share the joy, don't we, of what it is to know Christ. But if we use religious language, it, it confuses people. Now, by the end of 1959, Australia had a really interesting phenomena. We were the, the, the country that had 50% of the population had actually heard of the Billy Graham message. He came into Australia in 1959 and he stayed for about three months and he preached all over Australia. And so at that time, 90% of Australians said they believed in God, which is wonderful. However, it's not 1959 now, it's 2024. And only 20% of Australians say that they attend a church. And 43% of people would say that they're nominally Christian. So a lot has changed. But a lot of people also say they have no religion. And of those who go to church, a very significant number of them are Catholics. And so... What are we facing in Australia? What is it like and what can we maybe be uh, teaching and sharing with you? So I grew up in a government, uh, I grew up in a suburb where we went to the government high school. We had 1,200 students, but there were only 20 of us who were in the Student Christian Fellowship. And then I graduated and I went to Australia's largest technology university and we had a very small InterVarsity Fellowship group. There was only 30 of us. And so these experiences of, of being in high school, reading about Tom Landry and getting inspired that someone out there is able to boldly express their faith, but just wondering, how, how do I do this? So I've been shaped by the fact that the majority of my time I've been in the non-Christian world, and yet, I had a choice, didn't I? I could have retreated and had a private faith, or I could have decided, no, I want to be bold, and I want to actually learn how to express my faith in a public way. And so I've worked in 16 different industries, and many of them have been male-dominated. Uh, many of them have been hard-hitting, um, places that would be seen as barren, not open to the gospel. So what did I do? Did I silence myself? Well, those comics from Tom Landry and the Dallas Cowboys inspired me to say, no, you can have a public faith. You can express yourself. And I just want to thank, I don't know if there's anyone here who was part of uh, either shaping Tom Landry's um, career or publishing those, because I know they came from... There we go. Thank you. I want to say thank you, because... Um, a little kid in, uh, in Australia, in Melbourne, trying to work out how to have a faith in the context of a non-Christian environment was really, really important for me. So we know if you're publishing material for teenagers, you know, there's kids like me might uh, benefit. So 
uh, it's really important to, to, to do that work. And I just want to thank you. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to keep this kind of work going. So how have I approached my work in these very hard-hitting telecoms industry, construction industry, air freight industry, um, are the industries that I've worked in? Well, I've decided that the ministry of blessing people is the way that I can be uh, contemporary and relevant. So uh, the weather that we're having here in Dallas reminds me exactly of the weather that it was like back in 2018 when I first visited Israel. And I was there and I got to see the very place that it's believed in Acts 10, 9 to 38. It's the place where Peter had the vision of the, of the sheep coming down with the clean and the unclean animals all mixed up together. So this place, so I'm in the Tanner's house there in, um, in, in uh, t um, Joppa, can teach us something about living and working in a post-Christian world or a non-Christian world. It's as though this vision that God was giving Peter was a new model. He was giving Peter a new language. And the language was that there's a whole new paradigm to expand Peter's understanding of ministry. Prior to this, Peter was a faithful Jew and he had a very strict set of boundaries about where he was going to go and who he was going to be with. Uh, and he avoided certain people, he avoided certain parts of society, and he avoided food for the... He didn't want to be contaminated by those. So I just wonder at this conference, where's been your Joppa moment? Has God been revealing to you a vision of where perhaps your ministry has been too small? Has he been saying to you, expand your territory? Has he been saying that you don't need to restrict yourself to a certain group of people or to particularly um, Christians? Is he saying, go, go wider, go bigger? Let me pose this question. Where does the work that you do fit into your whole industry? What part of your industry has God called you to serve? So today I'll be sharing a case study of how God has called me to join with what he's doing to build up and support entrepreneurs. God gave me a heart for entrepreneurs, but particularly for women entrepreneurs. I was pouring out my heart to God one day about how lonely it was for female Christians. In, I, with my husband, owned a precision engineering company. And I just didn't fit into the male-dominated Christian business groups. I joined a few secular women's business groups, but I found that they were so hardened to the gospel that they had been in churches, a lot of them had grown up in churches, but because they hadn't been affirmed as women business owners from a Christian perspective, they had gone from being neutral to being quite hostile. And so I said to God, what are we going to do about these women who have got all these entrepreneurial talents, but they don't love you anymore? And maybe the church has let them down. And I just, I just felt so sad about that. And I said, God, what can we do? So I was looking for something. And, and so I saw this flourishing ecosystem in Israel. It, it, it was a way of encouraging redemptive activities which were connected, and I thought, maybe this is what God wants me to do. And so I saw it in action in Israel, and I've implemented it in Australia. I just want to share it with you. The Israelis call themselves the startup nation. They're a very small nation, and for their very survival, they have to work together. We too, as Christians, are called to engage in ministries which should not be running in isolation from each other. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, the New International Version says, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So I believe as Christians, we're not called to just be a blessing to the specific business that we own, but that we are called to be a blessing to the wider community where our business operates. 
So I've called this slide, Your Industry, Redeemed by the Gospel. If we truly believe the gospel changes everything, then the gospel is going to change the industry that you are in. So let me take you back to 2010. It was just before the Lausanne Conference in Cape Town, and I was chatting with God, and I was really concerned about the the Christians uh, in entrepreneurship, and particularly this group of women who were quite anti-Christian now because they felt that the church had never affirmed them as businesswomen. And I said, God, how do we act as ambassadors? What do we do? How can we, how can we bless and see these women flourish? And so I was looking for something. I was really looking for something to be able to bless them. And so I asked the question, how can Christians gather and invest their talents and support entrepreneurs so that they can see and experience redemption at both a personal entrepreneur level, but also at an industry level. And so this is the context of which I believe that I was called to a special ministry, which is to establish this ecosystem uh, for globally connected accelerator for female founders, and that's what I've done. God heard my cry for for what these women uh, wanted, and and I've been able to establish it. So... uh, I wanted something that I could show Australians. I wanted to have a diagram, I wanted a model that I could show them, I could show Christians where they fitted in and how they could help. And so what I discovered was that this little model, this diagram, actually helped me to explain where the gaps were. Most of the services that female founders needed we're operating in isolation. So all those points around the outside of the sphere there, they weren't connected. They were just isolated. And so you had the lawyers who were providing legal services basically to big businesses, not to women entrepreneurs. Uh, A lot of the women entrepreneurs that went to a lawyer found that they were misunderstood and they they felt quite quite disappointed that they weren't taken seriously. And, and so it went on. There was you know, accountants and all sorts of people who were part of the ecosystem in the business community were not serving women entrepreneurs. And so I was able to describe my vision of what God wanted to do to redeem entrepreneurship for women. I was able to describe that to Christians. And so we gathered a group of Christians and we decided to catalyze and create an entrepreneur ecosystem in Australia so that we could just raise up a whole generation of women entrepreneurs. Now, we had no official status in Australia, and uh, we didn't uh, have any particular title. We just decided to gather together. And so what we did was to pray, first of all, and we cast a vision of a different way of operating within the entrepreneur ecosystem. So we got all sorts of Christians coming out of the woodwork because when they got a vision of what could be done, they said, oh, I could help with that. We had Christian lawyers, Christian accountants. We had um, Christian coaches. We had people coming out of the woodwork who said, I think I could help. And so we've used this model to bring about redemptive activities in Australia. And each segment in this uh, ecosystem Here are some of the things we did. So with smart money, we found Christians who were um, angel investors, and uh, we found uh, a pension fund, one of the largest pension funds in Australia was run by a Christian, uh, venture capitalists, and we spoke to them and said, what can you do to help women entrepreneurs? How can you showcase what you do, and how can you showcase the women entrepreneurs? And so we we leveraged what we call smart money. We we changed the uh, the way in which people invest in women entrepreneurs. But we found the Christians. They were the first to pick up the vision. The title entrepreneurship. 
Women didn't identify with the title entrepreneur. They, they thought they were people who did bad deals, who were just, um, just, you know, just out for a quick buck, and, and they weren't genuine. Women entrepreneurs found that the, the way in which male entrepreneurs were being um, portrayed was, in fact, probably less kingdom-oriented. Women wanted to nurture, they wanted to have, build businesses that, were, that, that, that had an impact on the community. And so we changed the definition of entrepreneurs. We, we talked to journalists, we gave case studies, and so the stories of women entrepreneurs started to get lifted up, and then women said, well, if an entrepreneur is like that woman, okay, I'll give myself the title entrepreneur. But before that, they ran away from that title. Ideas and inventions. We showcased that women were coming up with businesses which were nothing like any of the men were bringing to, to the marketplace. Um, there's uh, one of the most famous women that went through our program invented absorbent underwear, which when she put that first to a lot of male uh, investors, they said, well, who would need that? And it, it's, it's a major phenomenon now, and it's a very successful brand, and she just sold it for $400 million. So um, ideas and inventions. You know, when we partner with God, new ideas come forward. Talent. Um, previously, when, when uh, CVs were looked at, a CV of a man's uh, successful entree into entrepreneurship looked a certain way, and we had to redefine what talent looks like so that investors would recognise different skills. Coaches and mentors, we mobilised Australian mentors, um, business people came on board, um, we worked on the culture of Australia. Australia has traditionally cut down successful people. It's called the tall poppy syndrome. And, uh, and we had to give a, a gospel redemption lens to that to say, no, it's okay to celebrate success. The connectivity. Um, a lot of the entrepreneur meetups were, you know, beer um, celebrations, uh, pizza celebrations. They weren't female friendly. They were held at odd times of the day when women weren't able to come because they had children. So we changed a whole lot of things about the way that this entrepreneur system operated. And we did it with Christians. Christians were at the forefront. The way in which academia uh, reported on uh, women entrepreneurs, we've, we've been stimulating that and trying to get more articles written. And so this is a case study of how when you ask God, when there's something on your heart, when you say, God, why is that the way that is? Is there another way? Could, could, are you doing something? Does it, does it matter to you that this segment of society is not doing so well? And God said to me, yes, I care about the women entrepreneurs. So the result has been since 2012 that more than 120 businesses have been scaled up, 300 businesses uh, are at the early stage. They've been supported. Um, there's uh, been more than $2 billion raised in capital, 17 su su successful exits and IPOs. Uh, thousands of jobs have been created and many new industries have been started. And this is all because a handful of Christians gathered, catalyzed, um, spoke and uh, cast the vision to non-Christians as well, governments, and uh, together we've all made a difference. So let me, <laughs> yes. So let me encourage you today. How do you think God would have you bring kingdom blessings to your ecosystem? Are you feeling called to work with your Heavenly Father to bring a redemptive mindset to the various elements of the industry where you operate? So let me give you some practical ways that you can do this. So what can we do? Well, we can pray. We can have citywide um, Christian prayer breakfasts, gathering Christians uh, in your industry. You know, you can send emails to key people in, in, in your industry. You, you can gather small groups of intergeneration. We've talked about young people wanting mentors. Um, th there's ways that you can just change the way your industry operates. And then let's consider... Um, Specific people and names of people that God would have you bless and encourage. So um, we can pray for key people. We can pray for investors and how they invest. Think about 
the, how money gets into your uh, sphere of influence, how it gets into your ecosystem. Pray for those people. Pray that the right money comes in, that the right deals are done. We, we, can, we can pray for those who produce industry conferences and journals and make sure that they're getting uh, the right speakers because often industry conferences set the tone for how our industry performs. Industry officials, presidents, um, you know, I write to people and I say thank you for the work you do. Most of the industry presence, whether it's the head of the, you know, the, the Engineers Association or the Architects Association or the Town Planners Association, a friend of mine is the CEO of the Surveyors Association, and, and you know, not many people ever say thank you. They, they complain about what the industry is doing or not doing, or the industry fees or whatever. So you, know, you can pray for your industry. Uh, you can pray for a Christian worldview for the, for the way in which your industry trains up the next generation of workers. I mean, that's so important, isn't it? I really do believe that as marketplace believers and ministers, we are called to not only have a role in our own jobs or our own local organisation, in our own businesses, but we're called to pray for the whole sector that we're part of. And it's my prayer that we'll all feel called to pray for flourishing in the faith and work ecosystem. So... Just as Tom Landry was a role model for me as a young teenager who wanted to see how I could have a Christian worldview about my work, I'd like us as Christians to want to bless and encourage others to bring light into dark places, to not retreat, but to get on the front foot, to positively make a difference. So how can we live in a post-Christian world? Well, we don't live in a post-Christian world, I believe, by being in a monastic lifestyle where we withdraw and, and just pray from a distance. I reckon we get on the front foot and we get involved. Um, that we are inspired by being spirit-empowered people. I'm inspired by a very famous Dutch politician, Adam Kuyper, who saw the world before him. And he reminded us again that Christ is sovereign and that we get the honour of being ambassadors with him. And so uh, if we just look at what Adam Kuyper said, he said, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ is not sovereign and does not cry mine. So let us celebrate being marketplace ministers. Thank you. Congratulate yourselves. <laughs>